Hi, this is Angela Hausman here with the IOTA Project, and here with me today is Amanda Boxtel, and I'd like for her to tell us a little bit about why we think she is so special and why it's <laughs> so important to have information like this on our website. So, Amanda. Oh, I'm not too special, really, Angela. I'm just a very ordinary uh, woman who happens to be living quite an extraordinary life. And I feel very blessed in the um, span of the 22 years that I've been paralyzed to pursue a journey that is, um, I guess, always in pursuit of the best quality of life possible. And what does that mean for me? That means... Um, standing up, I'm a paraplegic, I'm in a wheelchair, so I don't know if you can see me here. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been paralyzed for 22 years. However, um, I've done everything in my capacity to weight bear on my legs, to walk in a very natural gait, and to live a quality life so that I can now begin looking at merging biology with technology and I guess that's what the IOTA project is all right. about. Right. Okay, so in essence I'm, uh, just to give you a little, tiny little bit of background, I've been paralyzed for 22 years from uh, the core down, so from my pelvis down. Um, with the stem cells I regain some trace muscles. When someone sustains a spinal cord injury or so, so any type of paralysis, we're very prone to osteoporosis to uh, joint contractures and muscle atrophy. It's really important to weight bear on our legs and to stand in perfect biomechanical alignment and also to walk over ground. That means walking over ground with the world going by us so that we can get the proprioceptive feedback and the visual cues to help us rewire our brains so that we can eventually, I hope, do it on our own one day. And uh, with the stem cells, I did regain some trace muscles. I'm a proud owner of quadriceps, uh, gluteal muscles, abductors, adductors, and little tiny flickers of hamstrings. But it's not enough that enables me to walk on my own. And so I received the call that would change my life. And that was to become a test pilot for a bionic exoskeleton suit. It was a prototype at that time. And that was July 25th in 2010. I've been walking this device on and off for about three years. I was the very first person to own my own um, exoskeleton suit last year. And that was the first person in, in the United States. And so uh, July, 7, uh, July 17th, 2013 was when I received my suit in the mail and we unwrapped it. And I've been walking regularly on um, about four or five times a week, incorporating a rehabilitation regimen into my lifestyle. And um, this bionic exoskeleton suit, if you think of it as um, an exoskeleton is truly an outer shell. So it mimics the internal skeleton or endoskeleton inside my body. So the outside frame is very similar to the internal bone structure of my skeleton. And then the muscles are very similar to the motors on the exoskeleton suit. There are four motors that power me up and give me strength to take a step. There's a computer on board, which is just like my brain. And then there's also sensors in the robot and a lot of sensors in the feet, a gyroscope in the back. And these sensors send signals to the computer that help uh, determine when I'm going to take a step. But the, I'm the user and as the user, I play an interactive role in walking. And so my role and responsibility is to find my center of gravity in space and then also to shift my weight correctly. So when I take a step, it's not going to take another step until I've shifted both and I've forward and I've hit my forward target and my lateral or sideways target. And then the robot's intelligent enough and it'll take another step. So that's, that's it really boiled down into layperson's terminology for your viewers. Right. There's also a variable assist modality, Angela, where I have with the limited trace muscle power that I have, I'm able to contribute to my step. Okay. And the... The exoskeleton is intelligent enough where it's able to determine how much I'm giving and then how much it needs to give me to help me finish my step. 
And so this then comes brings into play the other types of um, levels of paralysis that people might suffer from. So say someone has sustained a stroke or and is a hemiplegic mm -hmm. and they're, they have one side that is paralyzed and or partially paralyzed. That affected side can walk with the assistance of the exoskeleton to in a very natural gait and we can actually turn off the other side of the robot so that the normal side that's not affected can just continue walking. So it's it's a rehabilitative device that will actually help improve with gait and gait therapy to get a person walking again in a very normal gait pattern. Right. Now do you see a point in time where this might not be rehabilitative but be a way of increasing mobility? for people who are paralyzed so that they could potentially put this on every morning just like an amputee would put on a, an artificial leg in the morning. I do see that day on the horizon. I see it as soon as possibly 2015. There's different companies out there. I represent as the executive director of Bridging Bionics Foundation. So while I wear the EXO as an exobionics manufacturer of this exoskeleton. There's other exoskeleton manufacturers out there. There's Rex from Rexobionics, Rewalk. There's also Indigo that's coming onto the horizon, uh, made from Vanderbilt University and manufactured by Parker Hannafin. Therapy device right. to get someone back walking normally. But um, there's, I see that it's going to uh, be able to go up uh, curbs and stairs uh, over uneven terrain, up and down ramps. I do see that this is going to become a device that will uh, be functional for daily living. Mm -hmm. And what the company has in invited me into so that I'm an integral part of the process, uh, they teamed up with 3D Systems and collaborated with them, Exobionics did, so that we could look towards a new design for... Um, an individual so that for the first time instead of a completely functional mechanical and utilitarian device we're now looking towards a design that could be this kinematic art form of design and beauty that would weave in a person's individuality and personality into the design itself and I was a part of that in that um, 3D systems came. I wore a skin-colored unitard. It wasn't very pretty, and um, and my body was scanned with a thirty-thousand-dollar camera. These right. images were then cast onto a computer screen, and those images were then printed into 3D parts that were taken from my own body, and they were created into these um, um, striated filigree patterns that were complex and they resembled my own muscles and they were put on this robot. Now this material is a nylon material that was 3D printed. It's very robust, it's very strong, super lightweight and flexible as well. And so ultimately it was as though my own DNA became a part of the design itself. And I presented this in Hungary, in Budapest, last November.